Anyway, so let's start with the first lecture uh, with an introduction to machine learning. And it will be really a rough introduction. So on YouTube, there are millions of videos which give you a really great introduction on machine learning and also on a lot of algorithms. There are a lot of lectures. So I will just give a really rough introduction. And also, um, I never work really in, in the IT and use machine learning in real life. So um, don't expect to, to get knowledge from a real expert here. And the second part of the lecture is um, we will talk about the first algorithm used in machine learning, which is called linear regression. Okay, so first of all, what is machine learning? So there are a lot of different definitions, um, but one common definition is that uh, machine learning uh, is the study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience. And now it's not really clear what we mean by experience, but somehow um, these are um, machines which have algorithms which get better and better over time with experience. And usually experience means getting more and more data. And machine learning is a, a subfield uh, of artificial intelligence. And um, it also has to do with a lot of uh, with, with data science. Because usually when you, you when a machine learns, it uses a lot of data. So these two fields are really connected. And one subfield of uh, machine learning is deep learning, which will also be part um, at the end of the lecture when we talk about deep learning. And nowadays machine learning um, has found its ways in, in, in a lot of applications. So on your phone, a lot of things use machine learning without you knowing it. Um, but maybe some common th things you associate with machine learnings are, for example, safe driving cars, uh, planes, rockets, but also computer games, um, and then image and video and sound processing. Um, so for example, these filters, um, Sarun is using right now this, this flower on his head. Um, this is also done by machine learning and um, it's used in speech recognition and also Google Translate um, depends on uh, machine learning, weather forecast or email span, ro robotics and so on. So there are a lot of application and machine learning is a really important and fancy field nowadays. So, but first, um, um, so what is, for example, not machine learning? And I want to make clear what is the difference between a machine which learns and a machine which does not learn. And by, when I say the word machine, what I usually mean is a program or an algorithm. So classically, um, a program, so if you're a programmer and you want to write a program, then the non-machine learning way is that um, there's an algorithm which you, you clearly understand and you can write down an explicit algorithm to solve a certain problem, which gets an input and gives an output. So one example is, for example, in linear algebra, you learn that if you have a matrix, then you can assign to this matrix a number, which is called the determinant, and there are explicit ways um, to calculate the determinant of a matrix. So in this case, for example, this is an example. Uh, well, you don't need to understand this Python code here, but this is, for example, an explicit Python code to calculate the determinant of a matrix. So therefore there's an explicit program we understand completely, which gives as an input a matrix and as an output, it gives a number, the determinant. So for example, the determinant of this matrix we, we learn in linear algebra is one times four minus three times two, which in this case is minus two. So this is an example of a machine which doesn't learn. It's just uh, created by the programmer and everything in this machine is clear. So, but now um, let's come to something different, um, which maybe is a little bit silly at the beginning. But now as humans, I can ask you, what do you see here in this picture? And then you would say, well, I see a cat, I see a dog, a dog, cat, cat, dog. And here it's a little bit more difficult because it's a dog in a cat costume, but we as humans understand that this is also a dog. 
So for us, it's really easy to decide which of these pictures are a cat and which of these pictures are a dog. But now imagine that you want to write a program which decides um, if a picture is a cat or a dog. So for example, you want to have a program and as an input, you give this picture of a dog, for example, just a list of pixels. And then as an output, this program should tell you this is a dog or a cat. And even though we, for us, it's really easy to decide what is a cat and a dog, uh, it's really hard to come up with an algorithm. So if you just give the pixels of an image of a cat or a dog, it's really hard to describe the algorithm if this picture is a cat or a dog. So this is a classical example where machine learning is, is perfect um, because the idea of machine learning, or first of all, um, how do we actually know that something is a cat or a dog? Um, the reason why we know it is because when we were young and we saw a cat or a dog, then usually our parents told us, um, well, this is a cat, this is a dog, and then we saw more cats and dogs. And um, after a few years, we were able to distinguish bet between a cat and a dog. So we, we learned to, to, to understand the difference uh, between cats and dogs, but still we cannot describe the difference between a, a cat and a dog. So if I would ask you, what is the difference between a cat and a dog? Then you would say, well, I don't know, but if you give me 100 pictures, I can decide this is a cat and this is a dog. And um, this idea of learning, we can also, so the, the, the idea of machine learning is that we um, create algorithms, which we can also teach like, we, like our parents did to us. Um, so the idea is that we, we do not describe this, this solution directly, how to decide what is a cat and a dog, but what we create is an algorithm which we can teach. So we create a machine which can learn, and then we, we train this machine or we teach this machine by showing this machine a lot of pictures of cats and dogs and always say, this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a dog. And then after training, what these machines can do is if we give them an input of a new cat or a new dog, then they can decide if this is a cat or a dog. And usually they, they decide with a certain um, certainty. So for example, in this case, the, the trained machine will say, well, this is a, a dog with 95% certainty. Okay. And um, <clears throat> so this idea of machine learning, um, there are a lot of different subfields. So the big field of machine learning um, roughly has three subcategories, which are called um, supervised learning, reinforced learning, and unsupervised learning. And in supervised learning, there are also two subcategories, which are called regression and classification. And for example, the example with a cat and dog, this would be an example of supervised learning because there was someone who told me this is a cat and this is a dog. So there's, there was some supervisor and the output was in this case, either cat or dog. So we did some classification. So the example I explained before uh, was in this case here. And we will also start today with an example of supervised learning, which will be linear regression and which will be an example here. But also there's a subfield which is called unsupervised learning. And there um, you will just get an input, like you, you get just pictures of cats and dogs, but nobody is telling you if this is a cat or a dog. But after receiving a lot of pictures of cats and dogs, you will learn that there are some two types of animals some looks similar, say they are cats, but I don't know these are cats. And there's another group, um, which will be the dogs. And then there's a um, field which is called reinforced learning, which basically means, um, well, I will also come to this later, um, that a, a machine tries something, and then after trying something, it will either get a reward 
or it gets punished. And then if it gets punished, then it tries something else. And uh, depending on if it gets punished or not, um, it will learn. Um, so the example with cat and dog would be there is a child and it says a, it sees a dog or a cat and it says a word. For example, it sees a cat and it says banana. Um, but then the parent slaps the kid because it's not a banana. And then it tries another word. It says cheese and then the parent slaps the kid. And then at some point the kid says, this is a dog. And then the, the, the mother says, nice, nicely done. And here's a cookie. So this would be an example of reinforced uh, learning. Okay. And so, but now a more precisely supervised learning. Um, so I said there are these two cases and um, classification and regression. And the, the main difference between classification and regression is, um, is how the output looks like. Um, so in general, the idea is always there's a machine with an input and an output. And the output in the classification case is always something discrete, which means that there are finitely many outputs. So for example, in the dog and cat example, there are two outputs. But here's, for example, another example um, if you want to recognize handwriting, let's say you want to recognize the digits uh, 1 to 10, then in this case, uh, or 0 to 9, and uh, there would be uh, 10 different outputs. So this would also be an example of classification. So if you have an input, a written, a written number, then the output can be um, finitely many states. But then there's also regression. And regression has as an output a continuous output. So in, in general, this will, in our case, will mean a number. So for example, it could be the price or the weight of something. So one example for this would be, for example, um, the pr price prediction for an apartment. Um, so for example, there could be a, a machine where you plug in a size of an apartment and the number of rooms. And this machine should tell you um, the, the price of this apartment. And because the price can be any number between zero and, I don't know, 10 million yen, um, this would be an example of an, a continuous output because it's a, so it's an example of regression because there's a continuous output. Okay. And then unsupervised learning, so the top left corner of the, the overview. Um, so first of all, here's again um, an example of supervised learning, um, the duck detection. Um, so in the supervised learning case, when you train the machine, you get pictures and a description. So you, you say to the machine, this is a duck, this is a duck, this is not a duck and not a duck. And then after training, using this supervised learning, because there was a supervisor who told um, what this object is. After this, this um, machine can say that this is a, a duck or not a duck. And the unsupervised part of this is that you just feed the machine with pictures of animals. And what this machine then does is just group them. But still the machine doesn't understand what, what these objects are. So it just uh, creates clusters or groups. And one example we will do on this lecture is called k-means clustering, where, for example, you have an input data points like this. And here you can visually see that there are somehow three different clusters. And this algorithm exactly does this. It, it somehow divides these, these data, what, whatever they represent, into different clusters. And this is an example also of unsupervised learning um, because this algorithm doesn't understand what these things actually are. It just learns that they, they belong together because they are somehow um, together here in the, in the input data. So this is one um, thing we will do later in class, <clears throat> but we will not do the Oh, well, maybe at the end, when we do deep learning, we can also build this duck detection uh, machine. 
And now uh, the, the reinforced, so the, the bottom part also, um, yeah, there I will not say much, um, but as I said, for example, if you have a robot and um, you want to let this robot walk by itself, then for example, uh, it, then it tries to walk in different direction. And for example, here, if it walks to the fire, then it measures it's too hot, so it gets punished. So he, he then noticed that this, his movement was um, something bad. And this is how, how this um, machine in the end then learns by trying and then getting either a reward or gets punished by something. And also this reinforced learning, like you can see here, um, has applications in, in games. So there I also want to give one example here. So maybe some of you are interested in computer games or chess and, and Go or Chogi. Um, so everyone probably knows chess. Um, so, uh, so a long time ago, 1996, um, there was a sensation that um, the, the, until then it was clear that any human, any really good chess player can beat any computer. But in 1996, it was the case for the first time that a computer was able um, to beat the, the current um, chess champion, Gary Kasparov. And this was done by, by IBM Deep Blue. But this was uh, not an example of machine learning. This is just a historical note. Um, but recently, maybe some of you followed uh, this story here of AlphaGo. Um, so Go is this game here, um, is much more, um, well, complex than, than chess. So there are much more possible Go games than chess games. So until, so after 96, chess somehow, the computers were always better than humans. Um, but um, for Go until uh, 2016, the humans were still always much better than computers. But then using reinforced learning, um, what um, uh, Google DeepMind, uh, a company which belongs to Google, they created this AlphaGo and AlphaGo was able to, um, to beat the, one of the best um, Go players, Lee Sodo from Korea. And um, this is an example of reinforced learning because what this program did is it played against itself um, millions of times and this is how it got better and better and better. And um, so this is a really good example of reinforced learning you write a computer programming, a, a computer program which plays a game and it just plays against itself the whole time. And then if, if one version of this program wins against another version, then this version gets kicked out of the game and then it tries to play against another version of itself, which maybe uses a, li a little bit different tactics. And then after millions of games, um, a really good uh, end program will appear. And also this was generalized in some sense. And um, then after this, there was so-called alpha zero. And it's called zero because this really starts by just knowing the rules of the game. And it starts at zero. Here in the case of AlphaGo, they also implemented some, some human knowledge into this game, at least for the beginning. But there's also now alpha zero, which uh, plays chess, chogi, and go. Um, on a superhuman level. And also there's, maybe some of you know StarCraft II, there's also Alpha Star, which is a computer game which plays this um, StarCraft II uh, against humans and it gets, uh, it's better and better. Okay, so this is an example of reinforced uh, learning. Okay, but now uh, let's uh, get let's get a little bit more serious by starting to talk about the first um, real example of an algorithm um, and try to, to explain it in more detail. Um, so what we will want to do today is talk about um, linear regression. And <clears throat> this maybe some of you know from, from linear algebra, but it will be solved in a little bit different way. So now, this example I choose here, um, let's assume we have some data 
here. So on the x-axis here, we have weeks living in Nagoya, and on the y-axis, we have the number of Tebasaki eaten. So in this case here, there are um, six points. So for example, there were six people who were asked, how many weeks do you live in Nagoya? And how many Tebasaki have you eaten during your time here? And you see here <clears throat> that the longer this, someone lives in Nagoya, the more Tebasaki they eat. And you also see that there's uh, maybe some, some line here, which describes roughly the, the relationship between living in Nagoya and the number of Tebasaki eaten. Um, so the, the goal, what we want to, um, uh, what we want to create is a program which predicts um, how many Tebasaki I, I would eat when I live a certain time in, in Nagoya. So we want to find a function which somehow describes uh, this behavior here by just using these um, six input points. <clears throat> So, and the main idea of supervised learning, so this will be an example of supervised learning um, because we, um, we tell the program or the, the algorithm, we will tell the input and the output. So we will say there's a person um, who lived two weeks in Nagoya and this person ate a five Tebasaki. Um, so similar to the, uh, we, we give a picture of a, a cat and we say this is a cat. But in this example here, it's just numbers. So two gives a five. And also there was one person who lived seven weeks in Nagoya and in his time in Nagoya a 20 Tebasaki. So this one set of data here where we have one input and one output. So this is called a, a training example. And in our case, um, we have six training examples and the package of all trainings examples um, is always called a training set. And um, an input is usually called, so this is here, input. Inputs are usually referred to as a feature and the outputs are usually referred to as a label or target. And during this course, there will be a lot of words we use. Um, and maybe because of this, I, I go now on the homepage and at the, at the bottom of the homepage, I give a reference um, here. So there's a so-called machine learning glossary by Google. And there you can find a, a list of a lot of words um, so if there's some word appearing somewhere and you forgot what this means, um, then you can go, for example, here. For example, we had the word label. Um, and here label was uh, the answer or result of an example. So it was the, the output of one example. And um, for example, we can also put here, look here, look here at F. Uh, yeah, a feature, for example, is an input variable. And then you can also click and see, for example, example. Uh, well, an example in our case is also called a training set. But anyway, there's this overview here, uh, which might be helpful during the course. So let me go back to, oh, yeah. Here. So, <clears throat> so in our situation, we have a training set, which consists in our case of uh, six um, training examples. And what we want to describe is a learning algorithm, which gives us uh, a machine, which um, often is called a hypothesis. So this, you can just, so this word uh, maybe, well, it's, this is a common word used, so we will also use, call this a hypothesis. So um, what this will be is just a program 
And um, this is our goal. So we want to create this out of these uh, training data of, of this training set. And then in the end, after we, we use this learning algorithm to, to create this, and this will be able to get any input. So for example, here we just have two and seven, but here we can also get as an input, for example, three. And then this will give us an output, for example, I don't know, eight. Maybe after learning with these data, this hypothesis, which is trained on these data, will say that if you live three weeks in Nagoya, and then I predict you will roughly eat eight Tebasaki. Okay, and the goal is um, to, to find the correct um, learning algorithm and also then to describe this hypothesis. <clears throat> Are there any questions so far? So please always feel free to ask in the middle using Menti or the chat. But maybe no. Okay, then let's move on. And um, so now let's get a little bit more serious. Um, so now I want to um, introduce some mathematical notation I want to use uh, because I don't want to use just pictures anymore. So um, the input values, um, the space of possible input values, uh, we will denote by X. So this will also be called the feature space um, because these input values here, in our case, weeks living in Nagoya are also called features. Um, so this will be denoted by X. And the output space, which is also called the label space, um, this will be called by, by Y. So for example, uh, in the dog cat example, the input space um, were all possible pictures. Oh, well, more precisely, pictures of cats and dogs. And the output space, uh, the output or the label space, um, there were just two possible values. It was either a cat or a, a dog. So in this case, well, you could say, this, say it's a zero or one, or you can say it's just a set of two elements, um, cat and dog. And what would be a training example uh, in this case? Well, training example is always an example of an input and an output. So a training example, so if you want to describe it with these words here, um, is a tuple in this space here, x times y. So this just means it's a tuple where the first entry is an x and the second entry is in y. And um, so in this case here, it would be a picture and a word, which is either cat or dog. And the training set is then, um, a set or a tuple of training sets, uh, of training examples. Um, so for example, in our Tebasaki example, uh, yeah. There, this training set is given by, um, well, maybe first, what is X and Y in this case? In this case, X and Y um, are um, weeks and um, number of Tebasaki. So in this case, this would be maybe the, the, the set of natural numbers, uh, but we can also say that this is, uh, well, maybe in this case, we can say it's a, it's a set of natural numbers. And the test, the training set, um, so let's go back here. So for example, there's two and five. So 
So here the training set is 2,5. Then the sec next one is uh, 7 and 20. And four others. And what we want to create in the end is a function h for hypothesis, which maps from any input x um, to the output to the label space y. So this here is usually our our goal is to create this function. And a learning algorithm is an algorithm which creates um, such a function. Um, depending on some training set T. So what we want to create is out of this T here, out of this object, we want to create a function. And this is what we um, mean by, by learning algorithms, because we want to learn this function H. So this T just has some inputs and some, just some special cases of X, but we want to create a function which can have any input of X. Okay, and the, um, so let, let me first go here. So this function is really, um, can be arbitrary, uh, but to actually do something, you need to, to have some idea how this H um, actually can look like. So you have to have some starting point because otherwise it's a, where should you start if you just say you want to find an arbitrary function which maps an input X to an output Y. So, so therefore um, one way or one learning algorithm is this linear regression. Uh, and recall, um, regression means that the output is um, continuous. So in our case, continuous means that this label space is continuous. So in our case, it's R. So here this, uh, why this is called regression is because in our output spaces will be uh, R. And um, what is the, the idea be behind linear regression? Um, well, if we go back to our data here, um, as I said at the beginning, if you look at this, then this looks really like there's some, some linear and dependence between these weeks living in Nagoya and Tibasaki eaten. And at this point, if you look at this data, um, you need to decide, um, or here you need to decide which learning algorithm you should use. And this will, uh, of course, depend on the data. And in our case, we, we see roughly that there should be some linear uh, dependence. And therefore, in this case, we choose this a linear regression. And um, so, if I draw a line here, so maybe let me draw this one. Um, so here I have, uh, I mean, on this axis, I have this X, the, the input space, which is in this case R, or the positive real numbers. And here it's Y, the, the label space, which is also R. So in this example, the hypothesis we want to create is a function h from r to r, um, which has this shape here. And this is just the a linear function. Well, it's not linear in the sense of linear algebra, but uh, it's just a, a line. Um, so in this case, um, how this looks like is that if I have some input x, then um, there should be well, in school, maybe you, you say this is m times x plus b, where m is just the slope and b is uh, the point here. So in order to find this purple line here, we want to find these two numbers, um, m and b. And linear re regression is somehow the generalization of this idea here. And so we will also not call this b and uh, m. Uh, we will call this theta zero and theta one x. And here in this special case, we also just have one input. Um, so here it's the weeks of living in Navia. 
Uh, but you could also think that maybe there's another feature which plays role in the, the number of Tebasaki eaten. So for example, you could add another feature which would, could be, for example, your income. So maybe if you are a poor student, like you are, maybe you eat less Tebasaki than the professor who gets paid well. So maybe the, if you have a line, the income, maybe also the number of Tebasaki eaten is influenced by the income. And therefore, you could think that maybe instead of just having one input, uh, maybe there could be another feature. Um, you can think maybe there's another feature, income. And then uh, maybe here you have the monthly income of this person um, with, uh, who lives two weeks in Nagoya, and maybe he has an income from blah, blah, blah. So in this case, you maybe have two features. And then um, the feature space will not just be R, then the feature space will be R squared because you have two inputs, so weeks living in Nagoya and um, the, um, the income. So now let's go back here. So therefore, uh, the general idea for linear regression is that we have as a label, um, oh, sorry, this is wrong. Features. So if we have as a feature space, R to the D, by this I mean the input are D numbers. So it's maybe um, if D equals two, then I, as, as an input, I give two numbers like weeks living in Nagoya and my income. And then the output should be um, in this case, the number of Tebasaki eaten. So in our Tebasaki example at the beginning, um, we had the case D equals one. Um, so Tebasaki case, Tebasaki. We had the case D equals one because there was just one feature. Uh, weeks living in Nagoya. But we will do it generally for D features um, because there could be a lot of input, but still the output will be just one number. And then, um, then um, an ansatz, so ansatz means an idea or so this is a word used in mathematics, a German word for uh, idea or, uh, yeah, actually I don't know how to translate this. Uh, so an, an ansatz for the hypothesis for the function we want to create. So the idea of linear regression is that this function um, has this shape here, that um, for D inputs, um, this hypothesis is given by some numbers, theta zero, theta one, up to theta d. So these are the numbers we want to find. And um, the, the features are here just multiplied by these numbers. And in the case d equals one, this is exactly, um, so this, um, in the case d equals one, we have two numbers, theta zero and theta one. So this, this vector of parameters, so these are called the parameters or the weights um, of this hypothesis. So here we have theta zero and theta one. And then this hypothesis um, has this shape here, like I wrote at the beginning, it's theta zero plus theta one times x. Yeah, so this, in the case when d is equal one, this is just the usual uh, line where the theta one describes the slope and theta zero is just the, yeah, the value at x equals zero. And in general, um, the idea of linear regression is that the hypothesis is given by this uh, function here. And we also um, can write it like this. 
where we take the sum from i goes to zero to d. So d is the number of features. And here we use um, the notation that x zero equals one. So you can think of that here, we always have uh, written uh, x zero, which is just one. Um, and this is just so we, we can write it in a more compact form uh, later. So, so the goal for us is now to find these weights. So we want to find, um, in our example here, we want to find the slope and this um, theta zero here. But in general, um, what we want to find is we want to find the best parameters, these thetas, um, for a given training set. But we need to make um, um, more precise what we, what we mean by, by best, or I mean, how can we decide so if you give me some, um, some thetas, then I should say, uh, this is a, these are good parameters or these are bad parameters. So for example, if I go back to the picture, so for example, this purple line, maybe let's choose here explicit thetas. So let's say, for example, this could be, I don't know, maybe the slope in this case is, uh, 1.5 and maybe here the value is 8. So in this case the theta with 8 and uh, 1.5 this seems to be seems to be good weights um, for this hypothesis. But of course um, for example this line here oh, let's make it more terrible so this is another age. So this is maybe uh, maybe twenty two minus I don't know what this is uh, zero point one x. So maybe this here describes this line here. So so these um, green thetas twenty two and zero point one. Um, they are not as good as these thetas. But how do we actually decide which of these weights are better? Well, um, it depends on the test data. So the reason why this purple line is better is because here, if I consider these differences between these test points or these test examples, or these training examples, sorry. So if I consider these differences, um, then they are much smaller than the differences between the green line and, well, maybe here it's not so terrible, but, but for example here. So you see that there's much more purple, uh, pink than red. So we want to measure somehow um, um, how good is this green and how good is this um, purple. And for this, what you introduce is a so-called cost function. So the cost function will tell us um, how good parameters are. So it will be a function which takes as an input uh, a set of parameters or weights, so these thetas, and then it will give us a number which tells us if these parameters are good or bad. So, ah, I prepared this slide to draw but now I already draw in the other picture. <laughs> anyway, so now what I want to introduce is the so-called cost function. Um, so what we want to do is giving training set, so for example, these six points, and um, we want to define the cost function. And there are a lot of different versions of the cost function, but one um, standard one is this one here, the so-called least square cost function. And maybe at the beginning, this looks a little bit uh, complicated, but what does this do? Well, so N, what is N? N is the number of, a number of um, training examples. Right here, we, we start with a training example and uh, we have n of them. 
Oh, and also one notational thing, maybe I should have said this before. Um, so here I use, um, similar to this um, CS229, I use the same notation. So um, maybe I go back, sorry. Uh, Yeah, here, uh, I use these upper indices um, to say that this is the first, this is the, the feature of the first um, training example. Um, and this itself will be an element in X. But in our case, this X will often be, X often will be um, R to the D and therefore, if, if this here is an element in there, so this is an element in RD, so this means this also has um, D entries. And uh, so therefore, if I write this vector here, I want to distinguish between the, um, to which um, training example this belongs and also which entry. So this is the first entry of the first uh, training example, and then there's the second entry of the first training example, and it goes up to the, maybe I put it here at the bottom. It goes up to the, um, this entry of the first training example. Um, so this is maybe confusing at the beginning, but this is the reason why we use upper indices here. So, so this is which training example and the subscript here described which entry. Because usually these training examples are vectors. And so sometimes we want to um, assign, we want to talk about the, the J's entry of this vector. Uh, but we also need to indice, uh, we need an index for the, to which training example this belongs. So maybe at the beginning, it's a little bit confusing, but um, yeah, always feel free to ask, please. But now um, we want to understand this cost function. Um, so again, this cost function should tell us if a, a certain choice of a parameters is good um, or bad. So what this cost fu function does, we denote it by J. We take the sum over all um, trainings examples. And at each trainings example, um, we consider the, the value of the choice. Um, so of our hypothesis, which depends on the, on this parameters. Um, so we evaluate this function H with these parameters at, um, at this training label. And then we subtract, um, the um, trainings label from this. Sorry, we evaluate it at the trainings feature and subtract the, um, uh, the trainings label. So this is exactly what I drew in the, um, in the picture. So these are exactly these red lines here. So because, um, For example, uh, here, there is um, the first um, trainings feature. And, um, and here is the first uh, trainings label. And the red line here, this is exactly the, the value of this, this line, the purple. The purple function evaluated at um, x1 minus, so here is the value h x1, and then I subtract y1. So this here is exactly this red line. Then this red line here um, gives exactly h x2 minus y2 and so on. So when we take these differences, so if our line is really far away from our training data, then these numbers are big. And we square them and we, we sum them up. 
and then we multiply it with one half. So don't worry about this one half. This is just because later we want to take the derivative of this function. And if you take the derivative of this two, I will fly here in front. And um, so this one half is not so important. But what is important is that you understand that this sum here, if the values of h at a certain trainings feature is far away from the trainings label, then this number here is big. And therefore, this j matters, takes the sum of all differences between our, our um, hypothesis, depending on these, on these um, parameters uh, and the trainings label. And therefore, this, this function here, as an input, takes parameters. And as an output, gives a number. And it's called the cost function. Um, because it somehow measures how expensive our hypothesis is. Um, and this just means if this cost is high, then these parameters are bad. So the goal is to find thetas such that the value of this function is low. So we want to minimize the value of this function. So this is uh, the goal. Um, so this is somehow the rephrased goal from before. Before we said we want to find the best parameters. And now using this cost function, this just means we want to minimize the cost function, which is a function from par parameters um, to a real number, which tells us if these parameters are good or bad. And again, in the case d equals 1, um, this j is a function from r2 to R. And it, it sends a vector R2, which is theta 0, theta 1. It sends um, to the sum 1 half j equals 1 to n. So for example, in our case, In our case, we had six um, trainings examples, and we had one feature, the weeks uh, living in Nagoya. So therefore, this sum here would take, goes from one to six. So for each trainings example, it evaluates um, h of theta. So what is h of theta? Well, h of theta, so this here is theta. And h of theta of x in our case is just uh, theta 0 plus theta 1 times um, x. So, uh, so here we would have theta 0 plus theta 1 times um, x j minus y j. And in our example, we, we have this xj, yj, here this j, one, two, three, four, five, six. So if you remember, these values were something like two and five. Uh, I forgot. But anyway, here the, the values, um, our test data. And here, the cost function for a given parameter theta zero and theta one, would take a sum over each test example here, and, and then evaluates um, the errors of this. So this is here h theta x. So it measure, it plugs this number in into this into this hypothesis depending on on these parameters. And then it subtracts the actual test, um, the actual label here in the test example. And then if these numbers are, for example, if we choose the purple numbers here, we get some number, let's say 10. And if we choose the, the, the green numbers here, um, then this number gets bigger, so for example, 20. And we want to find uh, the numbers in this case, in this case, zero, theta zero and theta one such that this here 
becomes small. And if some of you remember linear algebra, and at least I, I know some people here who took the course when I did it, um, then you know that in linear algebra, you learn that you can actually solve this problem directly. Um, so in linear algebra, you learn that for this simple case, there's actually an explicit way um, to solve this, um, this problem, this, which is often called the best fit. And so there, what you basically do is you want to solve a, a linear equation where you have more equations than variables. And this is usually not solvable. Um, so usually you have an equation, a matrix, which is really has a lot of rows and just a few columns. So in this case, we would have uh, two columns. And here you want to find theta zero and theta one. And you want to find um, a solution um, to a linear equation like this. Uh, but often if this matrix here is called A and this vector is called B, then this vector B <clears throat> will not be in the image uh, of this matrix A. Um, but one can try to ask for the best solution um, for these values theta zero and theta one, um, such that um, A times this vector is, is really close to B. And what you do for this is um, you consider the image of A. So let's say, for example, in this case, uh, we are in, or oh, maybe that's not important. Um, but what you want to do is um, the image of A lives in some space. Let's say this is the image of A, maybe it lives in R6. And B, um, so there's B. B is not on, the, maybe I just take a color here. So let's say this is the image of A. So let's say this is this. And so the red points here are all points you can reach by multiplying A with some vector. Um, but you cannot solve this linear equation here. So this means that this vector B is not in the image of A. But the best solution to this equation is by taking the orthogonal projection uh, of this B onto the image of A. And then you get some point here. And this point will be in the image of A. And the, the best solution is the theta zero and theta one such that you get this point. Um, and this is um, what you learn in linear algebra, um, which is exactly, you see here, this with a square um, um, has to do also here that um, in this case, if we use the usual norm in Rn, um, then this length here is given by the sum of the squares and we take this, the square root of this. And um, so this is really, if you want to find the, the, the mini, if you want to minimize the cost function, this um, particular cost function with these squares, this really corresponds to this um, classical problem in linear algebra where you use the, the classical norm in Rn and you want to minimize the, the distance between this, this vector B to the image of the matrix A. But um, we don't want to use this here. <clears throat> we want to, um, but maybe this will be not, we will not do today. Maybe I just explain it roughly. What we want to do is um, we want to describe an algorithm which um, has several steps um, and, and it starts with some arbitrary parameters theta and then it tries to improve these parameters uh, step by step and this um, will be done by the so-called um, gradient descent uh, which I will describe now but this um, so again we could give an explicit solution to this problem in this particular example but we want to use this easy example um, to describe this idea of gradient descent. Um, because later in the course, we will also want to minimize a function by using gradient descent. And this function will not be linear. Um, so in particular, in, in the case of deep learning, we also will use gradient descent. And in these cases, we, we cannot cheat and use a linear algebra to find directly our solution. 
Okay, <clears throat> and maybe now I just first describe the, the main idea. So recall, we want to we want to minimize a function, our j, and our j um, is an, a function from rd plus one, so it always has one more than we have features because we also have this um, this constant term uh, to r. But um, so let's so this is what we want. But now let's uh, think about a more simple example. Let's consider we have a function r to r. And uh, let's say this is this is a graph of x. And we now um, want to minimize this function. So we somehow want to find this value here. So let's say maybe this is theta. And we, we want to find this. And the idea is that we start at some point. So for example, we, we start here. We say, well, this is our starting theta. And then we look at the function f. And at this point, we need to decide, we want to decide in which direction should we go? Should we go to the left or to the right to minimize the value of f? And in this case, how do I decide if I need to go to the left or to the right? Well, in this case, it's clear I should go to the left. Um, and the reason why is because here the derivative of s, f is positive. Um, so if I go to the left, then the value of f and gets smaller. So here I really consider the, um, the derivative of f and the name of the derivative of f in a general case is exactly called the gradient. Um, so here in this case, if f goes up, then at this point the, the derivative is positive. Um, so what I want, so here somehow the derivative shows in this direction. So what I want to do is, um, so if I start with some theta here, I want to define a new theta by saying this is a, the theta at this point. And now depending on the derivative, if it's positive or negative, I want to add something or I want to subtract something. So if it's positive, I want to subtract something. So I say in this, the new theta should be theta minus, and then there will be some factor times the derivative of f uh, at the point theta. And this guy here, um, this will be called the learning factor. So you can see, so this here by this, I mean, um, I start with some theta. Uh, maybe the notation is now not good. Um, I start with some theta here. Then uh, depending, so then I plug this into this function f I want to minimize in the, the derivative. And if I um, have a positive derivative, then I subtract something. And if f is the derivative is negative, then I add something. So I either go to the right or to the left. So then after this, maybe I have a new theta, which is maybe here. And then I do it again. And here the derivative is still positive. So I go again uh, here and then I go again left, go here. And the amount I go, I walk, this will depend on this alpha. So this alpha is really small, then I, I correct slowly. But if this alpha is too big, um, maybe if this alpha is too big, then from there I would jump directly here. And maybe I would jump around and I would never uh, land in the middle. But if this alpha is chosen wisely, then here at the end, I maybe go here, go here, and then maybe I go there. And at this point, the derivative is positive. So I will go a step to the right. And then in the end, um, I will slowly arrive here at the, the theta such that f of theta is, um, gives me the smallest value. And <clears throat> So this is now for this special, for this simple case here, but we are interested in a function j, which goes from r d plus one 
to R. And in this case, um, this, um, this derivative is given by the so-called gradient. And, um, but this I will do more precisely next time, but now just roughly, for example, in the case D equals one, the J will be a function from R two to R. I mean, this is our Tebasaki example, because we have a map which sends a theta, which is given by theta zero and theta one um, to some, well, to, to J of theta. And these functions from R2 to R, <clears throat> we can still plot. Um, so for example, here, this is the graph of a function um, right here. So this is J of theta. This is the graph of a function depending on theta zero and theta one. So you can imagine that this is one example. And the idea is now similar. We start at some point. So we will start with some um, theta zero and theta one. And then maybe the value of this function j is given there. And then um, the gradient of j, which is denoted by nabla j, this is given by a vector, in this case, with the partial derivatives, depending on, so it's a uh, del, del theta zero of j. And here you take the partial derivative with respect to theta one. And the fact about this um, um, gradient is that if you are at some point and you consider the gradient of this function at this point, then this vector will show in the direction um, of the steepest ascent. So you can imagine that, um, for example, these are your standing on some hill and um, you have a machine which, which is like a compass. So the gradient in this case um, shows in the direction. So if you calculate the gradient of this position here, then in this case, well, I cannot, it will show in this two dimensional place, plane, it will show in this direction because here at this point, in this direction, it goes up. And, um, and therefore it's similar to the example before where um, going up means derivative is positive and, he, um, and going down derivative is negative. So here, what we want to do is instead of going in the direction of the hill, we want to go away from the hill. Um, but this I will explain next time at the beginning. So in, in general, what we will do is this formula, we will have a theta and then we will subtract a mul some multiple of the gradient. And the reason why we subtract a multiple of the gradient is because the gradient shows in the direction where you go up, but we want to go in the other direction because we want to minimize uh, our cusp our cost function. So you see here, if this would be our cost function and we start there, um, this gradient descent means we, at each point, we go a step away from the hill. So it could be that in this case, um, we will end up here in this valley, which gives a local minima. And then um, these parameters theta, which corresponds to this. So here, we will have a theta one and a theta zero. These will be um, good parameters for our hypothesis. And so this year, in our example with this um, linear regression and this um, quadratic function, this least square function, and we will not have this picture. In our case, we actually will always just have one uh, minima. Here in this picture, you see you have the several minima. And this year, for example, will appear at the end of the lecture when we talk about uh, deep learning. Um, there, these functions will look much, much more complicated. And then it could happen that maybe you're, maybe this here is a, the, the lowest point, but you will fall into this point here, which is maybe not as small as this. Um, so it can happen that your algorithm learns something which is maybe good, but in reality, there would be an even better solution for your problem. But yeah, so uh, this, uh, 
I will do next time. So for example here, this is an example how our J in our explicit example will look like. We really just have one a minima in this case. And then the gradient descent will always go down and find this minima. Uh, yeah. But this I will do next time and also next time uh, we will start by using a little bit Python where we maybe um, see a little bit of this gradient descent and see how we learn actually something out of data. But this I also want to include in the first assignment um, where you, where we will try to explain to you how you implement this in Python by yourself and then you can try to implement this gradient descent um, by yourself. So until next week, what I would like you to do is um, uh, create a GitHub account and then um, try to this test assignment where you just should try to learn to use Google Colab and GitHub. And then from next week, um, maybe we will have the first real assignment. Um, yeah. Ah, so there are some questions. So how is minimizing J and matrix A are related? Um, so, Um, so minimizing J means we want to find theta such that J of theta is um, small and the relation to this A is, so this A basically contains um, these training features um, and the, the values for thetas such that J is small corresponds to those thetas um, such that if you multiply them with A, will lie here on the image of A. So if you have a matrix and you multiply it with a vector, you get an element in the image of this matrix. And, um, and here, um, this B, which contains the training labels, um, is this vector here, which is not in the image. So we cannot find a perfect solution, but we want to find the best solution and best solution in this case means we want to find the orthogonal projection because this point here is the closest point to this point and this point is in the image. And therefore, um, this point here is A of the theta zero, theta one, which are the minima of this function J. But maybe this um, theoretical part I can also make clear next time. So after we implemented, after we did the gradient descent for this linear regression, maybe we should also talk a little bit about this and how we could actually solve this by using linear algebra and to recall a little bit uh, to uh, hi, what this has to do with this um, thing here. <laughs>